get into part two of this webinar series, how much bandwidth do I need in my oscilloscope? So I wanna start this webinar by punting the question over to you guys and opening up a poll real quick and see how much bandwidth do you need in your oscilloscope? So you guys could take a minute to answer that. There's only one correct answer. And after enough of you have answered, we will go over it. And Hillary, if you could just let me know when we are closing out this poll, that would be great. Yep. I think people were still logging in and not prepared to answer, so they're kicking <laughs> in now. Thanks, everyone. No problem. Uh, yeah, we could go ahead and close it. All right. So how much bandwidth do you need in your oscilloscope? There are three choices here, and the correct answer is choice C. It depends on the signal you are capturing. Now, just because I see here that some people have answered choice A and B, I wanna quickly talk about why those are incorrect. So choice A is incorrect because while having a bandwidth, uh, an oscilloscope with a higher bandwidth may be desirable, it's not necessarily what you need to capture the important frequency content in your signal. Now for choice B, while capturing the fundamental frequency of your signal is important, there is a lot of frequency content that occurs beyond this fundamental frequency. And so what it really comes down to is the amount of bandwidth you need in your, in your oscilloscope will depend on the signal that you're capturing and its frequency content. And so we'll get into why that is in this presentation, along with some basic rule of thumbs to help you decide on how much bandwidth you need in your oscilloscope given your signal. But before we talk about how much bandwidth you need, you need to know what oscilloscope bandwidth is. Now, simply put, oscilloscope bandwidth is the frequency at which the amplitude of your signal drops by three decibels, approximately a 30% reduction in signal amplitude. You can see here in this frequency response of this oscilloscope that the minus three dB point occurs roughly at 25 kilohertz. And so the bandwidth of this oscilloscope is 25 kilohertz. Now, while that's the bandwidth of this oscilloscope, you could see that the oscilloscope could actually process a wide range of frequency content from as little as 10 hertz to over 100 kilohertz. And the reason it's important that the oscilloscope can process all this frequency content is because signals, or square waves in particular, are comprised of sine waves with a wide range of frequency content. And ideally, your oscilloscope can capture that frequency content. More specifically, an ideal square wave is composed of an infinite sum of odd harmonic sine waves. I know that's a bit of a mouthful. Essentially what that means is that in an ideal square wave, its frequency content is oscillating in factors of odd numbered frequencies. So for example, if I had a one megahertz square wave, then the fundamental frequency of that square wave would be one megahertz but the additional frequency content in that square wave would be three megahertz, five megahertz, seven megahertz, et cetera, an infinite sum of these odd factored harmonics. And so the higher bandwidth your oscilloscope, the more of these odd harmonics the oscilloscope can capture and the more ideal your signal looks. So I wanna go over a quick example of how these odd harmonics sum up to create a more ideal square wave. So on this screen, we're looking at a dual grid view of a Teledyne LaCroix oscilloscope. Specifically for these measurements, I used an HDO 6000. Now in this left grid here, we're gonna be looking at the odd harmonic sine waves that will be the frequency spectrum in our signal. And on the right grid, we will look at the summation of all those sine waves and see how with the addition of more odd harmonics, we're gonna get something that looks more square, a more ideal square wave. So right now, the uh, first odd harmonic we're looking at is one megahertz. And since the sine wave will have the biggest amplitude out of all the other frequencies we're looking at, 
this will be the fundamental frequency of our signal. So let's see what that looks like when we add a three megahertz sine wave into this equation. So you can see this pink outline here is showing a three megahertz sine wave. And you can see the combination of this one megahertz sine wave and three megahertz sine wave showing up on this right grid here. Uh, you can see by these peaks, that's the three megahertz content and the one megahertz content is um, that, uh, that um, bigger amplitude there. So let's see what happens when we add our next harmonic, five megahertz. Highlighted here in light blue, you could see that five megahertz content impacting the shape of the signal. See it here on these peaks here that I'm pointing to. And the last auto harmonic I'll add here will be a seven megahertz sine wave seen here in light green, smaller amplitude. Now, I'm not gonna do this an infinite amount of times, but you could see that with the addition of seven megahertz, we're already starting to get something that is starting to look more square. And so the takeaway here is that Ideally, in your oscilloscope, you have enough bandwidth to capture enough of these odd harmonics uh, with your fundamental frequency to uh, capture enough important frequency content in your signal. So in this example, our fundamental frequency was one megahertz. And so bandwidth in this megahertz range will capture enough of these important odd harmonics that have uh, big amplitudes in your signal. But you might be asking yourself, you know, um, what, are, what are some rule of thumbs for deciding exactly how much bandwidth I need? So one rule of thumb states that you should obtain an oscilloscope with bandwidth that is three times the bandwidth of your signal, where the bandwidth of your signal roughly follows this equation right here of 0.4 divided by signal rise time. If you're unfamiliar with signal rise time, and stay tuned for our next webinar in March, where I discuss the relationship between signal rise time and bandwidth. But for now, I just want you to focus on oscilloscope bandwidth. And the takeaway with this rule of thumb is that ideally your oscilloscope's bandwidth is sufficiently higher than your signal bandwidth so that the oscilloscope is not limiting the signal's frequency response. Now, the downside with this rule of thumb is that it's not always possible to obtain an oscilloscope with this much bandwidth, especially in cases where the signal bandwidth is very high, like in high-speed serial data instances. Um, you know, the, uh, an oscilloscope with that bandwidth might exist, but it's a very expensive solution. And so a more realistic rule of thumb that uh, users tend to stick with is getting an oscilloscope with bandwidth that is five times the fundamental frequency of their signal. So in the previous slide that we looked at, the fundamental frequency of the signal was one megahertz. And so this rule of thumb is uh, recommending that in that case, we would get an oscilloscope with at least five megahertz of bandwidth. Now, what this rule of thumb is saying is that Ideally, your oscilloscope is capturing the fundamental frequency, the third harmonic, and the fifth harmonic. So I'll have three harmonics there. And it's also assuming that um, obtaining the fifth harmonic is a reasonable trade-off between how many harmonics you're including in your signal versus the price that you're paying for your oscilloscope. So now that you guys have a basic understanding of oscilloscope bandwidth and some of the rule of thumbs that can help you choose how much bandwidth you need in your oscilloscope. I want you guys thinking about this uh, more advanced topic, a uh, bonus question, if you will. Let's say I have two oscilloscopes. The one on the left sort of has this flatter frequency response. And then the one on the right has that more traditional roll off that we're used to seeing. I want you guys to think to yourself, which of these oscilloscopes has more bandwidth, the one on the left or the one on the right? Well, they actually both have the same bandwidth because the minus three dB point occurs at approximately 14 gigahertz in both of these oscilloscopes. Now, even though both of these oscilloscopes have the same bandwidth, because they have a different frequency response, they're actually gonna impact the shape of a signal entering the oscilloscope because they're reducing the frequency content amplitude a little bit differently. 
So for example, this oscilloscope to the left, if you have frequency content that is 10,000 megahertz, you would see no reduction in amplitude, zero dB reduction in amplitude. But if we were to use the oscilloscope on the right, you would see that at 10,000 megahertz of frequency, you're gonna see almost two dB roll off in amplitude of that frequency content. And so the takeaway here is that, um, you know, bandwidth is important in deciding the amount of frequency content that is visible to you on your oscilloscope, but also the frequency response of your oscilloscope plays a major role in what your signal looks like. Now, I can't speak on behalf of other oscilloscope manufacturers, but I can say that Teledyne LaCroix oscilloscopes give you uh, an option to choose between uh, different frequency responses, uh, whether it's a flat response or a more progressive roll off. That kind of gives you more insight to how the frequency content in your, um, in your signal is being reduced. So I wanna quickly take a look at what a signal would look like in uh, either of these cases with a more flat response and a more standard roll off. First, let's take a look at a flatter frequency response. You can see that the chart to the left, I have my fundamental frequency here in black, the third harmonic seen here in blue, and the fifth harmonic in green, all summing up to this red square wave with five harmonics. Now you could see that with this flat frequency response, there's no reduction in amplitude into the third and fifth harmonic. And so while we're getting the full range of amplitude of all that frequency content, you're seeing this pre-shoot and overshoot on the signal that is kind of giving that signal a not so clean look, it's not, not super square. But if we were to look at a more traditional roll off where the third and fifth harmonic are seeing a reduction in amplitude, you're seeing a signal that looks a little bit cleaner and a little bit more square. And so, again, I want to emphasize that, you know, on top of bandwidth, it's important to understand what the frequency response looks like in your oscilloscope because it is impacting um, what your signal looks like. So, just some closing thoughts here. I want to reiterate that. Bandwidth is the frequency at which your signal's amplitude is reduced by three decibels, or approximately 30% reduction in amplitude. Also, square waves are a sum of various sine waves with various different frequencies. And so the higher bandwidth your oscilloscope has, the more of these uh, sine waves the oscilloscope can process, and the more ideal your square wave will look. Now, that being said, the right amount of bandwidth in your oscilloscope is relative. It depends on the signal and its frequency content and the trade-offs you're willing to make between how many odd harmonics you want to capture versus the price that you're willing to pay for that. And lastly, we talked about how on top of the importance of bandwidth, how different frequency responses of oscilloscopes can impact the shape of your signal and will be an important consideration when choosing an oscilloscope. So now that you guys have a basic understanding of oscilloscope bandwidth and some of these rule of thumbs, I would recommend checking out this webinar right here on probe scope system bandwidth. Oscilloscope bandwidth is one thing, but when you introduce a probe into the equation, it complicates things a little bit. And so I would recommend this webinar as a good part two to this webinar. Now, where can you find that webinar and others that you might be interested in? You could click this hyperlink right here, or you could go straight to our website, teledynelacroix.com, click on the resources tab, then events and training, and you have the option to choose from registering for one of our upcoming webinars or view one of our on-demand ones. In either case, there are a wide range of filters and search options that you guys could use to find any topics of interest. And the last thing I'll leave you guys with here today is uh, the example that I did in on um, an HDO 6000 with the summation of all the odd harmonics and how adding more harmonics contributes to a more ideal uh, signal. Um, you know, if you don't have a Teledyne LaCroix oscilloscope, then I would recommend downloading Maui Studio onto your PC. Uh, you can register for free for a 30-day trial. 
you click this link right here. And the nice thing with Maui Studio is it comes with a user manual that actually walks you through some pretty cool examples of how to use Maui Studio. One of the examples is super similar to the example I did with the odd harmonics. So I'd recommend downloading Maui Studio if you want to get some hands-on learning as well. That being said, that is the conclusion of part two of this webinar series. How much bandwidth do you need in your oscilloscope? If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, John. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, just a reminder, you can go ahead and write your questions into the control panel um, if you have any. And uh, if you think of any after the webinar, John has his email right there and you can always email me as well. Um, we do want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we hope you'll join us uh, for one of our future sessions. Um, John, I'm not seeing anything on my end. All right. Well, I'll take that as a compliment as if I, uh, <laughs> I did a good job. Yes. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a great afternoon. We hope to see you online soon.